Okay? How to make disciples, part four, compatibility, choosing the right partners in life. Partners, plural, not meaning polygamy. Partners, plural, meaning that there's different partnerships that we enter into in our lives for seasons, different seasons. Quick review. Uh, we're talking about how to make disciples. Jesus' last will and testament, the final words Jesus said as we get to Easter. This is very uh, uh, especially important, but uh, the last words Jesus said before he really ascended on high and, and sent his Holy Spirit, Matthew 28, 19, 18 to 20, Jesus came to the disciples and said, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples. Jesus' last will and testament was, I want you to make disciples. Disciples. How are we going to do that? Go to all nations, right? Ta ethne is the Greek. It means all ethnic groups. Baptizing them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey everything I command you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. What do we get out of this? We're, Jesus is with us to the very end. He is ever present. So said another way, we're called to make disciples of every ethnic group by going across the street across the city, across the country, around the world, and share the love of Christ with others. Simple. Just go. Just go and talk to somebody. Go and share your faith with somebody. Uh, um, baptize all who respond to the good news of the kingdom of God in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teach them. Teach each baptized person what Jesus said and how to obey his words. But as I said, that if we're going to do this, if we're going to disciple people, we need to do two things. They need to be given some head knowledge. See, our, 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 our mistake or our weakness or our failure in making disciples is we teach people how to understand. Jesus didn't say go in all the world and teach people to know. He said te teach people how to obey. For too many Christians, the word of God is a nice suggestion, but we kind of pick and choose what we want to obey. See? We haven't really taught people how to obey. We've only taught them how to know, how to, how to understand. He said, we need some head knowledge. We need some head knowledge on what we need to do, but then we need some heart knowledge. We need to have some shared relationships so that the passion, that the, the encourage, the, the, the confidence, the discipline gets put into our lives. And those things are not learned through, through information. They're learned through shared lives. And so we need to share relationships. We need to be in relationship with people. And that's why we, we looked at this. I'd never seen this before as, uh, as I started to study this a month ago. Mark chapter 3, verse 13 and 14. Jesus went up on the mountain and he called the, him those he wanted. He didn't call everyone. He said, I've only got three and a half years to do this job. I'm going to choose the ones I want, those that I can come into a relationship with, to train them. There are other people I care for, but for right now I have to focus on those that I can partner with to prepare people to share the gospel after I've left. And so he went up on the mountain, and he called to him those he wanted. And they came to him. And then of those he wanted, he appointed 12 of them, designating apostles, that may, they might be with him on an even more intimate level. So he called people to himself to become his disciples. He called to, those, to him those he wanted, those he could be in relationship with, those he could partner with. And of those people, he called 12 of those, and he said, you're going to be my generals. Because actually that's one of the words, that, the, one of the meanings of the word apostle is general. And he said, I want you 12 to be generals because you're going to lead my people, my disciples, to bring the kingdom of God to the whole Middle East world and beyond. And so if we're going to make disciples, we have to learn how to connect with people, how to relate to them, how to be in relationship with them. There are four keys to healthy relationships. This is like, we're just laying some foundations, but there are four keys. If we're going to be in a relationship with people, there's four keys. The first key we looked at a couple weeks ago, authenticity. authenticity. How to be yourself. Just how to, how to be real before people. How to not be two different people. Remember he said the word hypocrite was a person that wore more than one ma mask as an actor. The word authentic means to only have, to have no mask really, just to be who you are. Always be who you are. Not have to pretend. Not have to hide anything. Right? Intimacy. Into me. See. I give you permission to look into my life. That's what intimacy is all about. Although it doesn't translate too well for the French. Sorry about that. The, the next thing we looked about healthy relationship. We looked about credibility last week. How to build trust. How to build trust with people. How to build trust when you've never had it. How to build trust when you had it and you lost it. How to get it back. 
Because again, you can never disciple someone if you can't have their trust. Right? If you haven't earned their trust. Today we want to look at the third key for healthy relationships. Compatibility. Choosing the right partners in life. How can two walk together, it says in the Old Testament, lest they agree. There has to be a degree of agreement in order to walk together. See, and as I said, Jesus didn't walk with everyone. He, he had picked those he, could, he realized that he could best walk with in those three and a half years, and he trained them up. And that's why at the end of his life, he was able to say, Father, I have you know, basically discipled those you gave me, and I have not lost one except the one who was already chosen to turn away, like the, that had already choose, chose to turn away from him, and that was Judas. He said, other than that, I have not lost one disciple. That's pretty impressive. But that's because he handpicked and he was able to build a relationship with people. I want to talk about life being about partnerships. We start with the reality that it's not good for a person to be alone. No one was meant to be alone. The Bible says no man lives to himself or he dies to himself. We all influence others. We all should be in relationship. Genesis 2.18, God said it isn't good for the man. And actually in, in the Hebrew, it's, it's not good for man. The word the shouldn't be there. It's not good for man to live alone. I need to make a suitable partner for him. We need partners in life. If we're called to start a ministry, we need partners. Uh, we had three partners go together to the Philippines for, for two weeks. Pastor Debbie's going with two other partners to bring the gospel to Mexico. It's all about teams and partnerships. A suitable partner. Now just, you know, unfortunately King James says, well, the King James Version says, a suitable helper. And, and, and you know, and say, oh, that's about being, a, you know, the woman needs to be the man's helper. There's only one other place in the whole Bible where this uh, word is used for suitable partner, and it's used of the Holy Spirit being our partner, our helper. So it's not about, well, woman is lower than man. No, it's about partnership. We'll look more at that in a minute, okay? Or am I here? I'm getting excited already. Everyone needs partners in life to love us, to support us, to, 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 to um, know us. To, to, to encourage us. Why do we need partners? Partnerships, there it is. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 10. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But people who are alone when they fall are in real trouble. One version says, pity the man who falls but has no one to help him. We are never created to be alone. We need partners. We need relationships. And we need to make important partnership decisions. Throughout our lives, we're going to need to make partnership decisions. Our first decision is, is the Lord going to be our partner or not? We need, will I give my life to Jesus Christ and have the life partner? We always talk about marriage being a life partner, but folks, life is eternal, and there's a partner you need before your marriage partner. You need the, the Lord Jesus as your life partner. Okay? He's got to be your life partner. So the first partnership decision is, are you going to enter into partnership? And, you know, people say, oh, no, he's Lord, he's not partner. I, well, I don't have time today, but I can show you three verses that says he's also called to partner with us in ministry and in life. Okay? We need to then make a, part, a, a decision about spouse partnership. Will I marry and have a suitable marriage partner? And who is that going to be? Another partnership decision. Friends, who will I seek? Will I seek some close friends as ministry partners? Or just as friendships? Will I have healthy partnerships or relationships with people to, to work with me, to help me to fulfill our common destiny? And business partnerships. Will I wisely enter into business partnerships with people who share my vision and values? Man, I just, the number of Christians I know that are so frustrated. This one man had a wonderful, successful relationship, but he went into partnership with a, a man who was not a Christian. And God started speaking to him about giving part of his business income to the poor and things like that. And his partner says, no way, we're into this, make money. I'm not allowing you to take one penny and give it to the poor. You know, and, and one, another guy, he wants to retire now and, and, uh, and, and basically go over to overseas missions and serve as the Lord as an over, in overseas missions. And his partner says, no way, I'm not letting you retire yet. You've signed this contract. We, we are going to run this thing together until such and such a date. And so this poor guy who now feels God has called him to become a missionary is, is not able to do that. See, you have to be, so when you make business partnerships, you have to be so wise. Have people with common vision and values, as it says there. You know, and as in ministry partnerships, like uh, the, the God will bring us people who can help us to reach our common destiny in ministry. Okay? 
Let's talk about the partnership called marriage. Everything I'm going to share today talks about all those different partnerships, partnerships in business, partnerships in, 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 in friendships, partnerships in ministry. But I want to focus on partnerships in marriage just because I, I can't talk about everything today, okay? So I'm going to talk about marriage. You know, like, do we know, do we know how to choose a marriage partner? Unfortunately, not too many young people here today, but that's okay. We can teach our young people. We can teach our grandchildren. The most people don't know how to choose a marriage partner. Uh, it's, very, it's very sad. Look, look at, um, actually, I'll stop there for a sec. The divorce rate has jumped over 250% since the middle of the last century. The divorce rate has jumped over 250%. That results in broken homes, broken relationships, broken hearts. See, and the problem is, as I said, the, that most of us were never taught how to choose a marriage partner. It's like, well, do you love him, right? Someone said, Mom, Dad, look, I want to get married. Well, do you love him? Well, to quote that famous theologian, Tina Turner, <laughs> what's love got to do with it? Right? Because feelings of love come and go. Feelings of love come and go. You don't build a relationship on love. You build it on commitment and compatibility and loyalty. <laughs> I see. Does Pastor Dave really think she's a theologian? <laughs> so we need to learn how to choose the right marriage partner. And then we need to teach our children and our grandchildren how to choose the right marriage partner. Let me give you some quick myths about marriage partners. There, I heard this one. This one drives me crazy. God chooses our mate for us. Well, if we really believe that, if we have marriage trouble, then it's God's problem, not ours, right? We can blame God. You choose, right? Isn't that what Adam said? It's that woman that you gave me. It's her fault for me eating of this fruit. Right? Because God chose. Did, now, God did chose that one. Right? <laughs> There's only one choice, and it's the best one. But that's not true of life. Uh, um, God guides us. He gives us instructions on how to choose the kind of person we should marry. But it's still our choice. He doesn't declare this is the only person in the whole world. Because that's, see, that's the second uh, uh, myth we, a lot of people believe. There's only one perfect custom-made partner for us in life. See, that's not biblical. You won't find that in the biblical. But the, that's not even logical. See, see here's, here's, here's the problem. If there's only one person that's right for you in your whole life, and you marry the wrong person, then by default, they will end up marrying the wrong person. But then the person they married will be the wrong person. And you will cause a worldwide crisis just because you chose the wrong person. It means everybody, the whole wide world is going to choose the wrong person just because you did. Because they can't marry you because you're already married to somebody else. It, it, it just, it's not rational. If one person makes the wrong decision with marriage, then it messes up the whole world. The truth is, there's no one perfect partner from, for you from heaven. See, the other problem is, the first time you wake up in the morning without those feelings of love that you had when you first got married, you go, oh no, maybe I married the wrong person. And it's that thought that will actually destroy your marriage. I know a guy like that. He, he young man, married a wonderful young woman. But in the spri one spring, all of a sudden, he decided, oh, no, I don't feel for the way I used to. I maybe married the wrong, the wrong woman. And he panicked, and he panicked, he obsessed on it. Within a couple of years, he was divorced, he left behind a wonderful wife, three children. He's no longer in ministry. I don't think he's serving the Lord. His wife is no longer serving the Lord because all the pain and anguish that came out of that. All because he woke up one morning with this thought, I guess I married the wrong woman. God's so much bigger than that, folks. Okay, there, uh, we could go on and on with that, but I just want to deal with those two myths. God will show you the type of person so that you can fulfill the, your common destiny, but there isn't that one only in the world. What kind of person you should marry? What kind of person we should marry? Somebody like Christ is, yes. Okay. Uh, let me say, there's two, 
to, to biblically, again, right, teach the Lord, teach them how to obey everything I commanded. Biblically, there are two non-negotiables in marriage. And then there's one suggestion again of you. But here, look at the first two non-negotiables. Number one, we must have spiritual compatibility. We must have spiritual compatibility. We have to marry someone who's a fellow believer in Christ. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 and 15. Stop forming inappropriate relationships with unbelievers. Right? Partnerships, we're talking about. Can right and wrong be partners? Can light have anything in common with darkness? Can a believer share life with an unbeliever? And the answer is, sadly, no. We think they can, but they really can't. See, what happens if we marry an unbeliever... If we marry an unbeliever, we now have a different core value. What we're saying is that we're uniting with someone in marriage who rejects the most important thing in my life. When you marry an unbeliever, that unbeliever has rejected the thing that is most important in your life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, the lordship issue. If you marry an unbeliever... Don't, don't hate me, but the, according to the Word of God, it proves Jesus really isn't your Lord. Because the Bible says, why do you call me Lord and not do what I say? What did he say? Don't be unequally yoked to an unbeliever. Like, I, I, I'm not here to condemn, I'm here to save you anguish. That's Luke 6.46. Number three, focus. See, what will happen if you marry an unbeliever? Then one day God will get a hold of your heart and you'll start to draw close to the Lord. And when you do, you'll draw away from your spouse. Four, intimacy. We cannot have full human intimacy without spiritual intimacy. We can't be one emotionally, relationally, and sexually unless we're one spiritually. Because in marriage, the two become one flesh relationship. There's a spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. And if you both are not lovers of God, it will, you will not ever be able to have complete intimacy with your partner. Number five, you'll be alone. You go through a crisis, you struggle in your faith, you turn to your partner, no help. You're going to have to live your Christian faith all alone without your partner supporting you. See, Romans 1 verse 12 says, I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. Well, there, if there's no faith in the other person, you're not getting any help. If you want God's best, choose a believer. Avoid all the anguish. Arguments for marrying an unbeliever. I, I just want to hit this really quickly. Arguments for marrying an unbeliever. The missionary dating argument. Well, I'm just, this, I know they're an unbeliever, but I'm just going to you know, date them and I'll lead them to the Lord and it's going to be really great because you know, they're a really nice person and, and, and I just, you know, they're a really nice person. I'm going to just win them to the Lord. Well, the problem is, if you date an unbeliever, you may fall in love with them and it's going to be really hard to say goodbye when they have become a Christian. Number two, we're in love. We've got to get married because we're in love. <laughs> Feelings of love come and go, folks. It, 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 it's commitment and compatibility that determine the health of the marriage, not your feelings of love. I, I hope I didn't burst any bubbles there, but it's true. Love's a wonderful thing, but you don't feel the same intensity of love every day. You, you, you can't make decisions based on how your feelings are. I love this one. I'll alter them. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we get, yeah, no, love is important, but it's not the primary thing in a relationship. It's funny, we, we go to a married couple, they go down an aisle. This isn't going to work in French, sorry. They go down an aisle, they come to the altar, they have the marriage ceremony, and then they sing a hymn in closing. And we train them that. And from that point on, it's I'll alter him. I'll alter him. <laughs> uh, 
I've seen. <laughs> that didn't work that well. Those were more gro groans of sympathy than actual laughter, right? See, the problem is you can't change anyone else. You can only change yourself. And so many people I know, they get married believing that, oh, I'm such a wonderful, godly person. Eventually, I'll change them. No, you won't. Not unless they want to change. Then we have the Mr. Wonderful marriages. I, well, he's just such a wonderful guy. She's just such a wonderful person. <laughs> but wonderful people can still drag you down spiritually. Do you know I mean? You may... You have, yeah, no, you don't. I, I was going to ask... The question I was going to ask was, do you know, have any idea how many people I know that married an unsafe spouse just believing that God would eventually change their spouse? Almost every last one of those people now was just waiting for the right date to divorce them because they've been dragged down. They can't pursue their spiritual life. They can't pursue their ministry life because their spouse isn't on board. And they're just waiting for the kids to get old enough Right? I hear that so many times. Well, I'm just waiting for the kids to all get university, then I'll divorce my spouse. It's, and won't that really help the kids? And then there's the wonderful, do the right thing. Well, you've had sex with them, now you need to do the right thing. Or you got pregnant through them, now do the right thing. Yeah, do the right thing. Obey the Bible. Don't marry them if they're an unbeliever. See, two wrongs don't make a right. Do we, do we, do we really understand that? Yeah, yeah. That two wrongs never make a right. And again, I know, I know women that got pregnant and married an unbeliever, and they're just waiting for the day where they can walk away because they realize that it wasn't right, even though someone said it was right. Wait for them to become a Christian, then marry them. See, because if you don't have spiritual intimacy, you won't have emotional intimacy, you won't have relational intimacy, and yes, you won't have sexual intimacy. Here, the facts about spiritual oneness. Okay, just got this out of a magazine called Marriage Magazine. Sorry, it was online, sorry. I, I just really don't read Marriage Magazine. As a man, I have to declare that. I do not read Marriage Magazine. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay, it says here, the average marriage with no spiritual oneness, the average marriage with no spiritual oneness, one out of 2.5 get divorced. That's 40% divorce rate. The average marriage where there is spiritual oneness, where do I put notes here? The average marriage that has spiritual, it's a couple actively, and, and this isn't about being enraptured together in the presence of God. If they will actively attend church together, if they will pray together as a couple every day, if they read their Bible together, one out of every 1,105 marriages ends in divorce if there's spiritual oneness. That works out less than one, less than 0.1% divorce rate. Less than 0.1% divorce rate if there's spiritual oneness. Well, what if I'm already married to an unbeliever? Well, then pray for them every day. Pray for them. Don't, you know, pray for their salvation every day and love them unconditionally the way that Jesus does and trust God to move on their heart. But it's still going to be your spouse's choice. And, and, and you know, and the same, as I said, the same is true. Business relationships, friendship relationships. See, even if you never get married, you're still going to need partners in life to, to work with you, serve you for the sake of the kingdom. People that are like us, they have the same commitment to us, they will pray for us, support us, love us, affirm us, help us. And, and that's why small groups are so important. The per, one of the purposes of small groups is to build those type of relationships with each other so we have friends. So that's the first necessary compatibility is spiritual compatibility. There's a second compatibility that's biblically necessary. And that's purpose, life purpose compatibility. Life purpose compatibility. You have to be going in the same direction. If you're gonna if you're gonna have a healthy relationship, you got to be going in the same direction. Amos chapter three verse three. Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? <laughs> Why does the Bible say that? Because so many people don't think about that. Well, 
He's such a nice man. She's such a nice woman. They get married, and you're going entirely different directions. If both partners aren't equally committed to going the same direction, there's going to be conflict. It's sim simple as that. And that's why you are not ready for marriage until you can identify God's purpose for your life. Because once you understand your purpose and your mission in life, then you can look at the, the person you want to be a partner and say, do they have the same mission and partnership? And if they don't at least agree somewhat, it, it, you, don't, you don't have to be like 100%, but you have to at least be going in the same purposeful direction. You know, Kathy and I are so different in so many ways, but our heart for discipleship has always been number one. We, we know exactly how God's calling us in terms of raising up disciples and, and, and some of the ways to do that. And, and we always get excited when we talk about those things. See, each, each person was put on this earth for a reason. Every last one of us. And no one else can fulfill that other than us. Like we, and we need to identify what it is so when we choose a partner, we can walk in the same direction. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, you are holy partners in a heavenly calling. He wants us to partnership together. So there has to be agreement in terms of our purpose. I remember years ago, I was trying to share my faith, and I got on a bus one morning, and I sat beside this woman, and she looked very, uh, looked like, well, she looked poor, but she also looked really depressed. And I said, you know, I, I just really... I want you to know I'm a Christian, and if you're willing, I'd like to share with you the joy that I have of serving the Lord. And she said, oh, I've already done that. It was a, we, it was a, it, it was a failure. I go, I go, what? What's your story? And she said, well, I met this man. We, we were attending one of the local churches in town. And I served in the, in, the, in the Sunday school department. I love kids, and, and, and I love studying the Bible and teaching children about the Bible. And I met this man, and this man had this heart for the street people, had a heart for the people in the street that were poor and struggling and starving. And we fell in love each other, with love with each other, and I just so much loved his ministry and his heart of his compassion for struggling people. And he so much loved my ministry and my heart of, of loving the children and nurturing them. And so he thought, this is going to be a wonderful marriage, and they got married. Week after their marriage, she wakes up one morning and goes downstairs, and there's a man on the couch with her husband's clothes on that he she just bought him. She goes, "What's going on here?" And he says, "Well, you know my heart for the street people. I found a guy last night. I brought him home. I showered him up. I put my clothes on him. I knew you wouldn't mind because you love my heart and my ministry." A couple weeks later. She wakes up, goes downstairs. There's a woman on the couch wearing her clothes. <laughs> he goes, what's going on? Well, honey, you know I love street people, and I found this woman on the street, and she didn't have any place to go. I brought her home. I knew you wouldn't mind giving her some of your new clothes because you know my ministry and you so much value it. And then she said, well, how are we ever going to have children if I can't trust that when I have children that we're not going to have strangers in the house at night that might do something to my kids. Within six months, they were divorced. A spirit-filled Christian man and a spirit-filled Christian woman, both loving God, both called to ministry, but whose ministries were so divergent that they could not walk together. They were not going in the same direction at all. She wanted to be in the safety of the local church and ministering there. He wanted to just risk everything for the sake of the people on the streets. And their lies didn't mesh. And in divorce. See how important it is to know your life mission before you get married? Picture your uh, life as a circle. And every other person in your life is a circle. The people that you're supposed to be in partnership with should intersect your circle. And if they can't intersect your circle, you shouldn't be partnering with them. There has to be common vision, common goals, common values, at least some degree of intersection. Otherwise, you'll never be able to partner in ministry or in marriage or in friendship even. There has to be some degree of overlapping of those circles. They don't have to be identical, but they have to overlap. See, many people are frustrated in marriage 
A woman is called to be a missionary, but the husband has these problems and he can't even travel with her. So they, they can't, they, she can never go and leave her husband. A man called to counsel and courage, but the woman doesn't want anybody to come into the home and dirty up the home. He can't do what he's called to do. See, you don't for a moment marry until you find out the person's mission in life. God loves you. He'll give you someone who intersects your mission. Wait for that person. See, when, when two people who are not called to the same mission marry, it's just heartache, it's frustration, it's pain. But when two people with the same mission come together in marriage, the result is a powerful team for God. A powerful team for God. Two non-negotiables. Number one, there has to be spiritual compatibility. And number two, there has to be life purpose compatibility. Those are non-negotiables on the authority of God's word. Let me, let me give you one more that's really kind of up to you. But at least consider this last one. It helps to have some personal compatibility. Yeah. It's funny, this is not biblically required, but something we're thinking about. See, just good sense to find someone that actually has some of the same interests you do. There's a lot of factors you can, can think about. But here, let me just throw out a couple, and some of them will go, well, what is he talking about this for? And I'll explain. Level ambition. If you have a spouse, one is super highly ambitious, and the other has no ambition, that will cause frustration in your relationship. It will put tension in your relationship. Level of, of, of education, or level of, I'm sorry, there should have been... I missed a level of intelligence. You say, well, what does intelligence have to do with it? If you cannot communicate on the same general level, it will frustrate your, your marriage partner. There has to be at least, at least it has to be some common degree of understanding. Level, and that's, I guess, level of education. Why level of education? Because you don't want one of the partners to feel super inferior to the other partner. You need to talk, at least, like I said, consider these things. Verbal skills. Why verbal skills? So you can actually talk. If one of the people is, has this incredible, eloquent vocabulary and the other person doesn't even have a clue what those words mean, that's going to cause tension in the relationship. Social background. Why is social background important? Because... You're going to bring home your friends, and if your spouse can't relate to your friends because you're in a different social background, they're going to feel all alone. Okay, there has to be some social compatibility. Economic background, why is that important? Well, if one came from a very rich family where they got whatever they wanted, and the other had to scrimp and save all the time, you're going to have conflict in your marriage relationship. Because one's going to want to spend, 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 and one's going to want to save, save, save. Um, expected rules in a marriage. At least consider them. Well, you know, like one guy, oh, I'm the bread earner, you stay home and look after the children. No. If she wants to be out there and get the better job, that could cause some conflict. At least you need to consider these things, right? What about expectations of children? Some people get married, they don't even talk about children. They get married a year later, the woman says, okay, I'm ready. He goes, ready for what? <laughs> for children. Children? You wanted children? We never talked about that. Why did you say something? Well, all families want children, not me. Right? See, you talk about that stuff beforehand. I wanted three. Kathy wanted five. But at least we're going in the same direction. And we ended up with four. <laughs> and family background. Why is that important? Because when you marry, you're not just marrying your spouse, you're marrying their family. And you've got to learn how to get along with their family. If you can't, that'll cause tension in the relationship. Okay. Well, what about this thing called sexual compatibility? I want to make sure I'm sexually compatible, so shouldn't we like, kind of have a dry run beforehand? You know, check things out. Go for a test drive, whatever the words are. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> this is on the internet. I'm expecting comments this afternoon. 
there, is, there has never been one study done yet that has shown that premarital sex makes for a better relationship. Not one. Yes, thank you. Quite the opposite. Of over the 50 major studies done in North America, actually all have concluded that premarital sex actually increases the likelihood of divorce, not decreases it. These are your secular psychologists telling you premarital sex may damage your relationship, not improve it. Sexual compatibility is not important for a marriage relationship. It just comes after all the other great stuff. When you're going the same direction, you're passionate about the same Lord, you're passionate about your mission in life, you're, pa you're walking in the same direction, you're seeing success in life, the, the sex relationship, it just happens. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> 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 and that's on the internet too <laughs> so how do you do that? But, but then how do you discover if you're sexually compatible talk about it with someone you're thinking about marrying not just about everybody <laughs> it's like hi my name's Dave and I just want to tell you <laughs> no. when it comes to a place where you're considering a long term relationship you need to talk about these things This was not meant to be a funny message. It really is. It's just like, okay. And, and also, you check other expressions of intimacy. Like, will they hold your hand? Yes or no? Will they give you a hug? If they won't give you a hug, that may be all you can ever expect. You know, it's like, it's like how do they express their other expressions of intimacy? When, hey, when I, first, when I first met Kathy, I was extremely reserved emotionally. I would not hug anyone. I would not hold her hand in public. I would not even give her a kiss on the cheek in public. And, and she just waited until I changed. <laughs> That's as far as we're going, boy, unless I see some improvement in you. That was wisdom. That was wisdom. Now, it helped to move to Quebec, where you can't help but become a hugger. Right? It's just like... <laughs> Or more. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> okay. Personal accountability. Be willing to make adjustments. See, this is the bottom line. Every difference between you and your spouse will become an adjustment. Every minor difference be means a minor adjustment. Every major difference means a major adjustment. Right? Just <laughs> it's the way it is. So you need to be realistic up front. How willing am I? to change. If you're not willing to change, don't bother getting married. And don't expect them to do all the changing. You're going to be half the one that makes the changes because they may never change. Avoid trying to find someone who's exactly like you because that will just lead to boredom in the relationship. But also try to avoid finding someone who's so radically different than you, that there's no common relationship at all. Some of the best marriages and some of the worst marriages have the greatest difference because it's really all about adjustments, being willing to make changes. It's on what do you do with your differences? And if you're not willing to budge in your differences, you're not going to have a healthy relationship. And again, I'm talking about marriage, business, friendships, whatever. Okay. Compatibility is a choice. Two people are, are able to be compatible if they're willing to be compatible. But you have to be willing to adjust, to change, to, to adapt. Okay? Um, I've heard some people say, oh no, we're just, after five years of marriage, we've just discovered that we're just incompatible. You say, no, you're just stubborn and selfish. Really? You're just... I remember once a guy left the church and he said, I'm leaving the church because of incompatible differences. I said, you haven't even talked to me. I have no idea what you're even talking about. But he already decided that we couldn't agree. I don't know if we ever agreed or not. He just... No, someone's being selfish here. Someone's being self-centered here. Someone's being... Well, you fill in the blank. Um... Okay, um, we've got to keep moving. 
three requirements for personal compatibility, okay? Three requirements for personal compatibility. I really messed it up the first time. One last time. Three <laughs> requirements for personal accountability or compatibility. Number one, you have to make the choice to adapt. Okay, Romans 12, 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do your best to, to adapt. Don't depend, to make on, to depend on the other person to make all the changes. You make the changes. If you're both willing, compatibility is guaranteed. Number two, choose to be emotionally mature. It's a choice. Choose to be emotionally mature. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 5. Are you immature? Learn to be mature. Are you foolish? Learn to have sense. Ninety nine percent of the relationship problems can be solved with two words. Grow up. <laughs> That's number two. <laughs> no, it's grow up. Stop being so selfish. Stop being so pouty. Stop just just grow up. Be mature. Make the choice to be mature. Marriage conflict is due to two immature people insisting on their own way. I read that in a book. Sorry. <laughs> Immaturity really is the number one reason for incompatibility. Number three, choose to make the effort. Choose to make the effort. Romans chapter 14, verse 19. Let's agree to use all of our energy in getting along with each other. Help each other with encouraging words. Don't drag them down, down by falling, finding fault. See, you only have so much energy in the day. Are you going to choose to use that energy to get along, or are you going to choose to use that energy to put down? Yeah. Are you going to use that energy to fix the blame, or are you going to use that energy to fix the problem? Yeah. You don't have energy to do both. So we stop finding fault, we stop criticizing, we stop spending our energy saying it's their problem, and instead you say it's our problem, now let's fix it. Okay? Okay, if you want, almost done, if you want the right marriage partner, if you want to find the right marriage partner, here's eight things. I know, it's like, number one, begin a personal relationship with Jesus yourself. If you want a healthy marriage partner that you can be completely united with, start by having a relation with Jesus yourself. Number two, make a commitment to God's standard for a partner. Don't do it your way. Don't be led by your emotions. Don't be led by one of those erroneous beliefs we talked about. Don't lower your standard just to get a warm body in your house. Okay? <laughs> I, met, I met a woman... And she was so desperate for a man. She went out and bought a man's pair of pants. She nailed it onto the bottom of her bed and said, God, fill those pants. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the goal is to get a warm body. The goal is to get a life partner, marriage partner. Okay. Don't date until your own emotional hurts are healed. Because if you don't get your own emotional hurts healed first, then when you look for a relationship, you're going to look for someone that will meet your emotional needs and you end up marrying a savior, not a partner. Enough there. Discover and clarify your life mission first. There's lots of good material on how to discover your mission, your ministry. Don't marry until you get that figured out so that you can walk together with your life partner. Know where you're headed. Know, you know, then find someone who's heading the same direction. Number five, until that day, get involved with other godly singles. You know, your marriage partner is going to suddenly show up in your living room one day. You're going to have to go make some friends. You know, when, when I was in university, we used to do what we call group dating. We'd all jump in cars and go to this place. We'd all jump in cars and go to that place. We'd go to a pizza place. Like for five hours, we'd hang out on a Saturday night at a pizza place and just hang out and make friendships. Until to this day, I can tell you all the names of the friends and where they live and how they're doing because we built relationships, even as singles. Go to lunch together. Go to movies together. Go to concerts together. Pray together. Number six, go slow. Go slow. Find out all you can about the other person. I've heard so many people again, I had no idea this person was like this. Well, did you ask anybody? Did you ask their family? Did you ask their friends? Did you ask their enemies? Did you ask their pastor? 
Or did you ask your pastor's wife? That's how you get the real, right? <laughs> well, because too many pastors are too, dip, too diplomatic. Well, you know, I just want to bless the person. And the wife says, honey, yeah, yeah, run, run, run. <laughs> Find out. Listen to what other people have to say. Number seven, get premarital counseling. I, I, I just never got this. A lousy cookie. A stupid little gooey cookie, and you're actually going to go to a cookbook and find out how to make a good cookie, and yet you won't get marriage counseling for something you're going to have to put up with for the rest of your life. You want to start a business, you immediately go and buy a book on business, and you learn how to start a business. But you may only have that business for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but you've got a spouse coming up that you're going to have to, you're going to, have to commit to for the rest of your life. Well, I don't need marriage counseling. I'm just going to play by the seat of my pants. And that's where her foot's going to end up when you mess up. That was just inspired. That one I felt was the Holy Spirit. Okay. <laughs> I'm having too much fun. There's some good books out there. There's a book, okay, there's a book by Neil Clark Warren. It's called Two Dates or Less, How to Know if Someone is Worth Pursuing. That's worth getting. Two Dates or Less, How to Know if Someone is Worth Pursuing by Neil Clark Warren. And he also wrote a book called Finding the Love of Your Life. That's an amazing book. Okay? And number eight, learn how to be friends first. Learn how to make friendships. Because here's what God wants for your life. He wants you to marry your best friend. And if you haven't learned how to make friendships, you're not going to marry a friend. None of us were meant to go through life together. Even if we never, never, none of us were ever meant to go through life alone. And that's going to be on the internet too. <laughs> Take, taken out of context, made large, put to music. <laughs> none of us was ever meant to go through life alone. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's like people went, oh, is that what you're trying to say? Yeah. Even if we never marry, we still need life partners. We still need to find people that are compatible to us. God's given us two compatibilities that are so, so important. That we have to be compatible in terms of our spiritual life. Spiritually compatible. We also have to be life mission compatible. Thirdly, just ask some questions, talk, right? See, and you start by making some friends. Learn how to be devoted to friends. How can you be devoted to a a person you're going to spend every day the rest of your life with that is full of flaws and challenges if you can't even learn how to be friendly to other people. That's why the Bible says, see, here's another reason for the church. Yeah. Romans 12.10, be devoted to each other like a loving family. God has given us a family. One of the reasons is to learn how to build relationships, how to build friendships. <clears throat> I want to take just a minute. Oh, wow, we've gone over. I had fun, though, but we've just gone over. How to begin a relationship with Christ. Remember we said if you're going to get ready for marriage, you start by building a relationship with Christ yourself. How do you do that? You acknowledge your sin. Romans 3.23, all is sin and falls short of the glory of God. It's not new news. It's true of all of us. Our sins have, have separated us from our God, the Bible says in Isaiah. So we acknowledge, yeah, I'm a sinner, but I believe that Jesus has given me the right solution, the only solution that if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord and believe in my heart that God raised from the dead, I will be saved. He will transform my life. He'll, he'll save me from my sins. So then I confess my sins and I receive the forgiveness that he's promised me. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So yeah, I just said, I just, how do I begin in relation with Christ? I acknowledge my sin. I believe that Jesus is God's solution to my sin. I confess my sins and I instantly receive his forgiveness from my sins and then I depend on God to give me that new life, to make me into that new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17, that he promised to give me. And you end up with a brand new start. You end up with a brand new life. You end up with a brand new clean slate. That's where it starts. Just close your eyes for a moment. People on the internet, please listen up too. If, if you've never given your life to Christ, please don't even consider marriage until you do that. The Lord is the one who gives us the grace to keep our relationship whole when the tough times do come.
So, Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray right now. If there's anyone in the room that you've never given your life to the Lord, just raise a hand for just a second put it down again. I'm not going to have you come to the front. I just want to be praying for you this week. Thank you. On the Internet also. Father, in Jesus' name, I just pray right now that as we recognize that we're sinners, we've gone our own way. We may have even gone our own way in marriage, and now we're paying the price. There's always a price for going our own way. Lord, I pray right now that those that accept the fact that they're sinners and they desperately need Jesus as their solution to their sin, I pray right now that as we confess our waywardness, we've gone our own way, that you would forgive us. You would cleanse us from all unrighteousness, as your word says. And Lord, we right now depend on you to change us, to change us. It's not too late to heal our marriages. It's not too late to heal our relationships, our families, our businesses. But it starts with knowing you, Lord Jesus. Lord, today help us all to depend on you, to do your part, and make us into the person you've called us to be. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just also pray for partnerships today. I pray for marriage partnerships, that you would strengthen them, that you would make them more healthy. They would learn how to work through their differences. I pray for friendship partnerships, that they would use their energy to get along, not to argue. They would build deeper relationships. I pray, Lord God, for business relationships. God, that, 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 that you would heal business relationships and cause the, the partners to, to, to serve you in everything they do. And Lord, I pray for ministry partnerships. People that are working together in ministry, God, that you would just bring them into a place of agreement that they truly could walk together. Lord, I pray that each person in this room would take these principles that were shared today and use them to have healthy partnerships in every aspect of their lives. God, you want us to succeed. You want us to, be, to, to have joy in life. You want us to be prosperous. You want us to, 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 to present, demonstrate the kingdom through all of our relationships. Help us as we trust in you. Lord, today we commit from this point on to only pursue godly relationships, to only pursue people that we're spiritually compatible with, and life purpose compatible with. Because, Lord, you want us to learn how to obey. That's where success truly is. That's where joy truly is. Lord, help us to be courageous enough to make those decisions. In Jesus' name.